Okay, uh, so Tepe, do you want to um, share or just speak? Uh, I can stop yeah. sharing. Okay, okay, okay. So let me share my screen. Uh, <clears throat> okay. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, I am Tepe Fukuda from Open Source Team uh, Aqua Security, uh, like Itai. Uh, <clears throat> uh, first of all, thank you for taking the time today. Uh, uh, I'll be talking about uh, uh, CP embedding in, into binaries or uh, Docker labels. So, but uh, I'm not sure uh, this topic should be discussed in this working group uh, because I'm, uh, it's the first time for me to join this meeting. So if that's not the case, uh, could you please forward me to the right place? Uh, but uh, okay, so uh, let's uh, get started. <clears throat> yeah, I, I think this, uh, this is very much the right place, I think. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. So uh, I'm a developer of Trivi. Uh, Trivi is an open source scanner for artifacts uh, such as container images, a local file system, and remote Git repository. And today I'll be focusing on container images. Uh, so basically the most vulnerability scanners depend on the package managers uh, such as YAM, uh, apt, APK, and NPM, RubyGems, and uh, Python PAP, and so on, uh, to get the package names and the versions from the container image. And also the usually the ecosystem uh, provides security advisories. Uh, in this example, the Red Hat provides uh, security advisories uh, called uh, RHSA, and also Debian provides security advisories. Uh, so each ecosystem provides a security advisory. So vulnerability scanners can detect the vulnerabilities of packages uh, installed by package managers easily. But uh, many offshore image Docker, offshore Docker images uh, installs a primary software through the make uh, self compilation, self compiled. Uh, for example, the Redis uh, 5.0, uh, which is an offshore image in Docker Hub. Uh, this is a Docker file uh, to generate this, uh, to build the, this image. As you can see, the Redis is installed by make, uh, make minus C, user source Redis installed. So, <clears throat> uh, yes, here. So there are some challenges. Uh, so vulnerability scanners cannot detect uh, vulnerabilities of self-compiled binaries because uh, no standardized security advisory for self-compiled binary. And also need to associate the binary with uh, vulnerability information. So in other words, uh, we have to generate the uh, software bill of materials from binaries. Uh, <clears throat> I think that we can use uh, uh, CP, Common Platform Enumulation, for the purpose. Uh, I'll uh, explain later, but uh, uh, we, ha we don't have to use uh, CP. Maybe we can use a uh, uh, package URL or a software ID or uh, something else. But uh, in this proposal, uh, I'll be talking about CP. Uh, CP represents the software and the software version. So uh, in this case, the Redis uh, CP 2.3, A, Redis Labos, uh, Redis. So <clears throat> this is a CP name. And also the NVD, uh, National Vulnerability Database, uh, which has uh, all information about uh, CVE ID assigned vulnerabilities, uh, provide the CP lists. Uh, as you can see that in this case, the Redis Labos Redis uh, is affected by this vulnerability. So uh, we can associate, we can cross reference the software information with security advisory from NBD. So my, uh, the goal of my proposal is uh, associating the binary with uh, CPE name and make use of it for uh, vulnerability detection. Okay, so this is a uh, uh, goal of my proposal. Uh, but there are some difficulties to generate CP names. <clears throat> uh, CP name consists of uh, uh, colon separated strings like this. Uh, CP 2.3 A, A means uh, application and Redis labels, Redis 5.0. Uh, especially the vendor and the product uh, version are important for vulnerability detection. 
Okay. <clears throat> but uh, for example, the, in the example of Redis, uh, we, we know just only the binary name. Uh, this case, the, it's a Redis server. But we don't know the Redis server is from Redis labels. So we don't know the vendor name uh, from the binary. And also the binary name is Redis server, but the product name is re just Redis. So they are different. So we have to know Redis server's product name is a Redis. And also we need to know their version, of course. So it's a, a little bit difficult to know uh, vendor product version from binaries. So there are some approaches to uh, detect the CP name from binary, hash based and uh, version option based uh, and so on. Uh, the first approach is uh, preparing the hash based mappings in advance. Uh, calculating file hash of the binaries and stores it in the database with the CP name. Actually, the uh, not uh, only CP name, maybe the uh, vulnerability information can be stored with the uh, hash. Uh, anyway, the, we have to calculate all hash uh, of the binary. But of course, it requires huge database. Uh, because uh, if the version uh, is incremented from uh, 5.0 to 5.0 colon one, uh, the file hash will be different. So we have to cal calculate the hash again and store it uh, in the database. So it's uh, a little bit difficult. Also the, the second approach is uh, version option based. Uh, <laughs> At first, we have to prepare the mappings uh, between the binary name and the CP vendor and product. Uh, Redis server is uh, from uh, Redis labels. And also the product name is Redis, like this. And, or, and also uh, we can uh, use uh, minus V option. In this case, the Redis server minus V. Uh, but uh, we have to format the output because the minus V option displays uh, more information than uh, just the version. Uh, Redis uh, was compiled uh, GCC 2. Point, I don't know, but anyway, we have to format the output like uh, this, uh, cut and uh, set uh, orc or uh, something like that. Uh, but uh, as you know, the minus B option is not standardized. Uh, some software uses minus minus version. Uh, some software uses minus B and uh, Java uses minus version and the OpenSSL uses just version without uh, hyphen and minus, just version. So minus V is not standardized. So we have to prepare all options for each software. And uh, so it's uh, almost uh, impossible. So uh, anyway, the, it's difficult to generate CP names from self-compiled binaries. Uh, okay, so the, my proposal is uh, embedding CP names into binaries or uh, Docker labels. And the first approach, uh, first proposal is adding a new section for CP name. Uh, in this example, uh, just build the Go binary from the Go source code and embed the new section named CPE uh, into the binary by object copy command. And of course, after that, we can extract the CP information from the binary uh, by object copy or uh, any programming languages uh, such as C and Go rust uh, everything so uh, now that we can generate the cp name from binary and ideally, ideally uh, it should be done in the make file uh, in the each software but uh, it, if it's difficult i think uh, we can do it in the docker file uh, so in, uh, like this uh, at first it builds a redis binary by make command uh, make minus C redis and uh, embed the CP name into the binary uh, by object copy command. And after that, install the binary. So <clears throat> now the binary uh, redis uh, in the redis official image uh, has the uh, CP information. <clears throat> uh, also that we can embed CP names into Docker labels. Uh, so <clears throat> like this, uh, uh, we can use the uh, uh, label instruction like uh, label CP equal CP 2.3 Redis labels Redis 5.0 uh, 
Uh, it's uh, useful for only for container images, uh, but uh, it's still uh, <coughs> useful enough. So the, my goal is to improve the accuracy of uh, vulnerability scanners. So to be honest, I don't care about how to achieve it. Uh, and ideally, the, uh, we can embed the CP name or uh, any software metadata into binaries. Uh, it's useful for uh, host scanning, not only container scanning. I mean, the virtual machine scanning or uh, bare metal uh, Linux scanning. Uh, and also, uh, if it's difficult, we can embed CP name into the Docker labels. Uh, it's useful for only for container scanning. Uh, but uh, not only for Trivi, uh, our scanner, but also all scanners. Uh, yeah, so uh, any means to achieve the goal. Uh, actually, the, I think we can use CPE and uh, package URL, software ID, and the Cyclone DX, uh, and so on. And yeah, so anyway, I want to detect the uh, vulnerabilities of self-compiled binary. I, I'm saying self-compiled, but uh, I mean the, any software that uh, is uh, not easily cross-referenced to security advisories. Uh, so any software uh, to, uh, which is difficult uh, to detect the vulnerabilities. Uh, yes, uh, that's it. <laughs> may may I you. jump in real quick? Yeah, thank you. May I jump in real quick? Uh, this is David Wheeler. Yeah, so I don't know if you you probably haven't been able to follow the uh, chats while you're uh, presenting, uh, but just as a quick note for those who are, haven't uh, noticed the uh, chats and notes, uh, this has actually been proposed before to OWASP dependency check. Uh, Dale Visser actually uh, proposed the spec and in fact a pull request to this for OWASP dependency check. At the time it was rejected for reasons I actually don't agree with. Um, and so I think it's a perfectly valid time to, yeah, and you, you, if you look up uh, Anonymous Penguin, if you look right above, uh, the, the text right above already notes this and includes the link. Um, so I think it's a good idea. Um, I think uh, CPE can be embedded, pearls can be embedded. I would embed a homepage URL. I don't, I suspect you can't embed SWIDs because SWIDs are hashes and you can't embed the hash and then produce the result of the hash as the result. Um, but that's okay. Uh, I, I'm not, uh, you, know, you know, not being able to support SW, SWIDs is not really a problem. Um, so I think this, is, this makes sense to me. Uh, other thoughts? Well, this would, might require some revisiting past decisions. Yeah, hi, this is Sharif and I sit on the board of the OS Foundation can bring that up. Um, but um, I, I deal with vulnerability management every day and use NPD extensively. So being able to map uh, a piece of software a little bit better to CVE is really helpful because from a developer or a software maintainer perspective, they want to know if there are vulnerabilities in what they use or what they're responsible for. So instead of waiting for a scanner to run through, they want to say, okay, these are the products that I care about. Is there a new advisory that comes in that has that map? So um, it would be useful. I would say that having sort of an abstraction of here's the binary, there's a unique identifier, unique identifier of type uh, CPE and then the CPE details might be um, helpful in case there are others that are also might be used for might happen further down the line because NVD themselves are trying to sort of push, for example, for a better approach such as SWID tags. There might be others as well that might be useful, but right now the only game in town for mapping that to vulnerabilities is CPE. So at the very least, this is uh, worthwhile. Well, uh, only game in town is a little little uh, challenging. Uh, you've so got SWIDs and you've got pearls yeah. and you've got uh, homepage URLs. And I, I think I, my understanding is that there's a fight within NIST. Uh, mm -hmm. Some folks think that everything should be SWIDs because that's an ISO standard and ISO standards are perfect in all possible ways. The only problem is that SWIDs actually don't work because they don't have any version information. Every SWID is a single version ID. 
So you can't say from version one to version seven, which is absolutely necessary for a report, a system for identifying vulnerabilities. So you've got a group that's really sure that they want something that won't work. <laughs> yeah, I, I did talk to them about that and they did say something about the ranges, but I would, I would, I would just clarify when I meant only game in town, I meant that there's identifier to CVE right. that that right. exists. That doesn't mean in the future it won't be. It's just right now the most useful one would be CPE, although it has its own problems, right? So it's right. not necessarily perfect. It has data quality issues. And hopefully in the future, we'll find a better approach. Yeah. But being able to uh, in, uh, embed multiples means that, you know, if we embed a CPE and something else, then when the something else comes along, great. And make sure that's embedded too. Yeah, the key thing is the tooling that makes it a little bit more transparent to the developers. So they just either uh, it updates the numbers for them or they put in just make sure that you have identifier there uh, to make it a little bit more seamless. So if it's a little bit easier for them, then uh, that might have less resistance. But as a whole, yeah, it would be quite helpful. Yeah, there, there's a chat discussion about if more software vendors supported S-bombs, I think that'd solve the issue. I think you got it backwards. Mm -hmm. This helps solve the S-bomb problem. Right now, uh, the solution is make sure that every single developer across the planet always provides S-bomb data, absolutely with perfection. Um, I wouldn't put a timer on that. Uh, but if people start embedding this data, we don't have to have everyone simultaneously do everything all at once. We can have, and, and there's a, a provides them a way to extract it. Yeah, I would say it's it's multi-layered. So the first layer is the CP. What is this binary called? What vendor it is, and so on. The second part, which helps with the overall software bill of materials, is what is it made of. So if you find like a vulnerable library, critical vulnerable library, you want to know in your entire state where it's where, where it's located or in which pieces of software it's in. That's the next level of detail, which would help with the S-bomb. But I would argue for every sort of entry in an S-bomb, it would have, this is the CPE for this particular piece of software that or that a unique identifier for it. Yeah, I don't, I don't think we're talking across purposes. It each helps the other. Yeah, yeah, no, it definitely does. And, and I think the, the, the way I understand it, that the root of the like, issue we're, we're discussing today is like, how do we get that information for software that is not obtained from a vendor or a package repository, but built from source code? Like this is the, the way I understand like the, the current issue we're, we're discussing right now that normally if you're relying on um, like some sort of package manager to get your software. You have technical means of like identifying that piece of software. But if you uh, just grab, fetch the source code and run make, like this, this, this information disappears. That's how I understand. Like Tepe, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I yes, yes, understood that this is essentially yeah. the problem. Yeah. But it, yeah. It, well, it, it seems, the, the problem is here's a binary. What's where is it coming from? If all you have is if you have the source code, then you have more information. But most people don't. <laughs> you know, even even if source codes exists, they're going to run the prepackaged binary compile, not recompile it themselves. Yes, and even not if they the run data. the even if they run the precompiled uh, binary. Uh, at the time that the binary was compiled, the CP information could have been embedded in it. So even if it's built on a on a an, as an automated build or something like that, if the maintainer can make sure to embed the CP information, then everyone can benefit, even end users who don't have the source code access. I. Uh, I'm sorry for my camera, but uh, one of those problems is that I, th I think is uh, CP, CP embedding is easy for the binaries, but you still have issues with like uh, scripting languages like uh, Python libraries or Perl libraries, uh, which does not necessarily have anywhere to embed the information. 
So it's it's fairly easy to take the CP and embed it into a Docker container because they wrap uh, the sort of the source code of the project. But the second when you start dealing with uh, Ruby, Perl, Python, all these sort of source-based languages, you start probably going to have an issue with different ways to embed the different CP informations. Yeah, there's yes. Exactly, but uh, usually the Python packages and uh, Ruby packages are installed by pip or uh, RubyGems. And in that case, uh, they have the metadata, uh, which is a machine readable, uh, standardized. So in that case, uh, of course, uh, we, it's difficult to embed the uh, CP name into the Python packages and the Ruby packages. But uh, uh, it's okay as the first step because uh, they already have the metadata, uh, standardized metadata. So, uh, but yeah. So you sort of have several different, you sort of end up with several different ways to sort of fetch the CP information, which it's, it's a slight improvement, but I don't think it necessarily solves the entire problem, which uh, something like uh, SPOM or uh, bill of materials uh, could potentially solve. Yeah, I, I, again, I, I think, um... For vast number of situations, you know, the S bomb has to come from somewhere. And if I have a binary, where is this data coming from? And the current answer is you don't get it. So I I, I think you're assuming the S bomb exists and therefore it solves it. But this provides the S bomb the 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 data to create those higher level S bombs. Right. So, so getting back to um, like the why we're here, that would I, I see this as something that we as a working group could like get a proof of concept of, like how an open source developer could provide that information, probably by you know embedding something in the source code, the build scripts, or or things like that. Um, so I, I think the like the best avenue is to continue the discussion in the GitHub issue. Um, and try to come up with uh, some sort of next steps in that. But I, I think this is uh, uh, this is super interesting because it sounds like it's a it's a missing it's a missing step step in the whole as bomb story, which as I'm as I'm understanding it is a is a huge part of um, the open source uh, vulnerability disclosures. Um, righty. Thank you. That was uh, super interesting and super useful. In in the interest of time. Um, I would pass this to Art and Emily to tell us more about the bins. Sure. Uh, thank you. Thanks for having us. Um, I, I threw a, a suggestion, suggested edit to the, the Google Doc meeting notes. Um, my company is trying to trying as hard as we can to, to sign up for uh, join the Linux Foundation and, and jo join this working group. We're hung up in our on our side in a stupid uh, bureaucratic document signing problem that I will get resolved, but um, very excited to be here. And I was very excited to see a, a first topic. I didn't know what to expect, but that's something I'm spending a lot of time on as well. Um, so not directly related to events, but strongly indirectly related uh, to events. Um, so uh, I'm Art Mannion. Um, with me also is uh, uh, Emily. Hi, Emily. Uh, I'm Emily starting, so. Okay. We, we work at the CERT Coordination Center. Um, in, in, uh, in summary, CERT has been doing a lot of coordinated vulnerability disclosure uh, for a long time, like 20 or 30 years. And um, part of that is that we actually do that work, but we are a, uh, an FFRDC with a research make the world better component. So part of that is also to help uh, other people, other organizations do that work better. Um, to that end, oh yeah. So all the credit goes to Emily because she is the lead developer, almost only developer perhaps. We have an infrastructure person and we have Emily and a bunch of users who keep chatting with Emily all day about um, you know feature creep and dumb bugs and things we wanna have changed. Um, uh, our parent organization is called the Software Engineering Institute. Um, despite that possibly misleading at times name, I don't think we are professional software engineers, at least Emily and I are not. I would not call myself one. 
Um, so this project has also been very eye-opening in terms of um, you know, pr producing a internet facing web app. Uh, and we'll get to this in a minute, but we're planning to open source it and try to figure out what an open source dev process and community looks like, uh, you know, firsthand. Um, anyway, though, sorry, let me get back on track. So um, this coordinated disclosure practice uh, we've been doing with a mismatch, mismatch of tools, Lotus Notes, Ancient Perl, Five Code, uh, lots of email, uh, various versions of PGP and GPG over the years. And um, we've been, you know, for, for a long time looking for a better tool solution. This led to lots of looking around at off the shelf stuff, uh, nothing off the shelf fit, um, off the shelf plus custom dev, eh, nothing fit well, custom dev plus off the shelf wasn't a great solution for us. Um, largely due to Emily's interest and in availability, we went with um, just custom dev. So Vince is a Python, Django, and other stuff based web app, or maybe three or four web apps that work together. Um, we started using it in March, Emily, in production. May, end of May. May. So. Sorry, um, starts with M, okay. So May, we are very much doing uh, testing in production, although we're you know, several months down the road, so, so some of the major issues have been worked out. Um, the idea here is basically, if it, if it makes some sense, a you know, internet facing you know, bug tracker, Git, GitHub issues tracker is the right vague direction, but with security and privacy, so it's they're not, they're not public issues. Uh, and the multi-vendor component, which touches on the supply chain problem and the SBOM problem, was really where we found nothing off the shelf that fit. So, right, I can just run Jira or uh, I forget the open source thing. I used to run uh, Track or something, uh, Bugzilla. I believe those all support, you know, user at, user access and authorization, access control. Um, but what is a what does an issue look like that has one vendor, one researcher, one coordinator? got three participants, you keep it private, great. You fix it, it's published, great, publish it. Um, you know, you go, I'll look at Google Project Zero, for instance, they have a bug tracker. I don't know what they use, probably some, some Google thing. And they eventually make the bug public and you can see all the history there. Um, the bugs we deal with are dozens, sometimes hundreds of vendors involved. We're trying to track the state of each vendor, have they been notified? Have they responded that they are affected or not affected? Have they produced a patch or an update or an advisory? Um, this is, this is the, the complexity basically that led us to develop Vince. Um, let's see. What is the name oh, again? Yes. Vince? Vince, yeah. I'll ask Emily to maybe type it in the chat or throw some URLs in there. Um, we, we have, we have, so let me, actually, let me stop a minute. I don't want to take up too much time. We have some slide where um, we're not against doing a live demo. I don't want to um, abuse our time. What, what's, what are we looking at? What would you like? What would anyone like to see or not see? I guess I'd, I'd like to just first briefly understand what is Vince uh, actually going to do? You know, what's its scope? Yes. I'd love to see a short demo. I don't know if okay. other folks have, if there's time for that. Okay, <laughs> I see at least some other folks have the same view. Okay, yeah, that, that, that probably depends on how long the demo is going to be. Well, again, yeah. we, we can be flexible. We've done this show. Emily and I are getting used to this uh, particular show, um, but we want to be you know, cautious of the time frame and people's interest. So I, we're new to this forum. So please just tell us, you know, you have 10 more minutes or 20 or yes, please put all your time into the demo or Art, keep talking or Art, don't keep talking. Just tell us what you like. And we can, we'll get back to what Vince is, um, David, to your point. Yeah, I, th I think we have like time-wise, uh, some like ten minutes is is probably okay. uh, realistic. Em Emily, would you mind would you mind doing sharing your screen and running a demo, and I'll just yeah. quickly try to quickly shut up about um, kind of what it is to try to answer David's question, right? So, um, if anyone's familiar these days, I guess the modern version of this is also uh, you know Bug Crowd or Hacker One, right? Um, somebody can submit a vul report, a vulnerability report to us. Currently only CERT runs Vince. Um, we have, again, plans to open source it, let others run their own instance. We're figuring out how to make it bigger, but 
Someone can submit a report of a security bug to us. They can do this anonymously without putting in their name or they can log into events first and submit it. We now have a, a ticket and we go through these tickets every day, sort out which ones we're going to work on, which ones we're not going to work on. You can imagine tracking actions and emails coming and going. Um, it is our preference that users who want to talk to us in Vince about their ticket have an account in Vince and the conversation happens here. I mentioned PGP earlier. We are trying hard to move away from PGP and email. You know, it works for people who know how to use it. When you get beyond three or four people, that, that breaks pretty badly. Um, so, uh, right, web-based HTTPS as opposed to email-based PGP for, for crypto. Um, Tickets, a case, we open a case in here. We can invite vendors. All of the vendors invited know who's in the case. There's no wondering, hey, is the other Linux distro in here or not? I don't know. You can see all of that. Hey, is the Japanese coordination center in here? Are the Finns in here? Is the US in here? Is CERTCC in here? Who are the coordinators who reported this? Who are all the vendors affected? That's just transparent on the case. Uh, anyone in there can see sort of what's going on. So the case is in here. At this point, um, you know, the, the overall point here is the coordination, the private coordination for a vulnerability happens here. Uh, in the end, Vince also is our, our uh, content production and publication system. Um, so we can produce our advisory, we call it a vulnerability note, which is you know, our, our direct need here. But the, the overall goal here is that there's a right, internet facing accessible platform, web-based, not mail-based for uh, private coordination of vulnerability reports that the CERT CC is participating in. Um, overall, we remain, as we were before, open to anyone reporting anything. And we, we, we pick and choose our cases based on you know, our resources plus where we think we can add the most value. Um, I'd like to say over the years, it's been great to see that lots and lots of maintainers and developers and vendors are handling their own cases and we are less needed in a lot of those areas. Um, I will say that um, supply chain problem, multi-vendor problem cases don't have an easy answer. And that's where we find a lot of our work uh, still happening. And that's it was a major design consideration for Vince was to handle multiple, multiple vendors affected by a library or a protocol vulnerability or some shared tech uh, that upstream they all end up sharing. I'm hitting my pause button. Emily, please speak right. up if you'd like, or anyone else have questions? Yeah, I'm sorry, if I, if I can interrupt for just a moment. I mean, you, you're starting to demonstrate something, but I first wanted to understand what it, what it was you're demonstrating. So let me, yeah, let me try was... to paraphrase what this is. It looks to me that this is a security vulnerability issue tracker, but it's designed to support multiple affected suppliers and projects and multiple relevant researchers. It enables private reports and discussions and it's web-based instead of email-based. Um, have I got the basic idea? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> so let me, I'll just kind of go through what I, what Art was talking through there. Um, so someone can submit a vulnerability report to our uh, web form on kb.cert.org. You can create an account before you submit that vulnerability report. Um, if you create your account, then you'll be able to potentially participate in the coordination process. Um, so I did one earlier today. And when that comes in, it comes in as a ticket. And we kind of evaluate that ticket and determine whether we're going to take that case, right? Sometimes it's as simple as they just, the, the reporter didn't have the vendor contact information. So typically we won't take cases like that. We might just get back to the, uh, to the, reporter and say, hey, here's the contact information. But um, if we do take the case, then we can add information like the vulnerabilities, we can add vendors and notify them and participants. And all that then creates a, uh, a case discussion in what we call VinceCom. This is kind of the, the portion where all of you can create an account and come potentially participate in the coordination process. But it's very, um, Similar to a message board, once you log in and you get access to the case, which means that one of our coordinators gave uh, you access, whether you're a vendor organization or a reporter, um, we have to give you access to that case. You can go actually see the, the original report that was submitted to us. 
you can see any of the vulnerabilities that um, we had added to the case and then the expected date public. And then basically what this is, is you just kind of communicate with everyone in the case. You can tag people, you can tag the reporter, you can ask for more information. And it will send um, email notifications that way. That way you can come back in and, and see, um, you know, the, the case discussion. Um, we ask vendors that are involved in the case to uh, submit their status and statement. So you can do that here. You can see all the vulnerabilities that we've identified, whether or not you're affected, and then potentially submit a case statement and the URLs um, that you have. So that's pretty much the gist of it. I know we don't have a ton of time, but there's also other things. You can um, direct message us at CERCC through this portal. You can update your contact information. Every organization has a group admin, so you can add additional users to um, your, that your organization's cases, and so they can get access that way, and they don't have to go through us. Because um, we didn't want to change, or we don't want to trade the, PGP key management problem with kind of user management problems. So we kind of try to hand that off to a, uh, a group administrator that we designate for each organization. Does anyone have any questions? I actually do have one. <laughs> yeah, I actually do have more, more like a big picture uh, question. So I, I think Art, you mentioned that you are currently the only organization running this. So did you get any interest from other organizations to run a system of this kind, or maybe perhaps this like a copy of this exact system? Yes, and um, while I am perhaps not the best project planner, and that's actually entirely true, um, we do plan to basically open source fence. Um, and that is one of the one of the routes towards others running it. Um, we've had we have had interest, uh, and I mean, you know, we looked really hard for off something off the shelf. There wasn't anything, so um, that to me is a might be a very small market gap, but it seems to be a gap. Um, we deal a lot with right maintainers, developers, vendors, uh, vendors who have security teams. Um, we've heard lots of stories over the years about what they're doing. Right, you hear, you hear great stuff like. Um, uh, uh, Excel spreadsheet and SharePoint is a common starting place for some people. Um, the existing bug tracker and try to put some privacy on it is a starting place for a lot of people. A lot of home built stuff, a lot of attempts to bastardize um, CRM and trackers and things. So we are, we are, we are planning to open source it and let anyone run it. Um, and uh, yes, that's the, that's the path towards others being, being able to use this. Oh, Emily, go ahead, please. Sorry. Yeah. I was going to say email addresses. How do we contact you? Yes, yes. I'll put them in the chat. Uh, and again, uh, despite my organization's best efforts to stop it, we are trying to join and regularly attend this, uh, this working group. So you will hear more of me and I'll be louder about, well, anyway, I'll, I'm planning to join. Um, so hopefully we'll see more of you folks. Um, I'll put email in here. Uh, as I, as, as we part, um, Emily reminds me about the API, which I threw in the chat as well. Despite not liking PGP and email, it's a lowest common denominator of sorts, lowest common comms channel. Um, if everyone's got their own custom web app, how do you talk to each other, right? Everyone, everyone having a login and using their own fingers on someone else's web app is not gonna scale really well. We are super interested in how to get that to work. I imagine the answer is a common-ish API. But to be common, you of course need input from people who are doing this, not just us. So one of our next efforts is build out the API a little further with some early adopters and then start a discussion somewhere about what does a common vulnerability coordination API look like? Something generic enough, everyone can use it. Bigger discussion, but we're open to all kinds of input on that. Okay, thanks. Yeah, that's, that's pretty much what I was going to get at. So yeah. thank you. Yeah, thank yeah. you so much. Yeah, thank you. That was uh, that was awesome. And I think this is also a topic that it's it's a very good fit for our working group, like enabling that coordination and data exchange. It, like we have identified that very early on as 
um, something that is important to us. And I already saw somewhere that you can like generate a uh, CV JSON uh, document. Yeah. So this is one of the things we're going to be uh, looking at as well. Um, yeah, we're in, yeah. okay. Yeah, and um, yeah. like, but welcome to the working group. It's uh, like you don't actually have to be a Linux Foundation. Um, member to participate, which is, which is pretty okay. great. Um, okay, and we, we started with uh, an S-bomb-ish uh, discussion and um, Steve, is, has Steve joined? Because he was supposed to join in oh, yeah. a second. Hey, welcome. Um, so Steve was kind enough to offer to uh, show us what uh, one of the S-bomb standards, uh, how it supports uh, vulnerability, uh, information sharing and remediation tracking. Absolutely, yeah. Thanks for thanks for having me. Obviously, um, if you, um, what I'm going to show is is how Cyclone DX does things uh, today. Um, if you were on the NTIA Vex uh, sub uh, subgroup um, uh, call a couple weeks ago, I think it'll probably be a, a very similar presentation. Hi, Art. <laughs> um, but uh, let me go ahead and just uh, share my screen. Uh, okay. All right, everyone see it? Yeah. Okay, great. So um, real quick, uh, Cyclone DX is a software build material specification. Uh, we've got a formal standardization process. Um, but these are the tenants. This is the way the Cyclone DX actually approaches standards-based development. It's uh, very unlike most standards development processes by design, it's risk-based. But for the sake of this conversation, uh, we're gonna focus on the facts first uh, because that's really going to matter once we talk about um, uh, vulnerability disclosure and then remediation. So uh, just to kind of level set um, what it is that we're talking about, uh, Cyclone DX is extensible. Um, the core, the base specification supports only static factual information. So these are facts that do not change over time. Now, Cyclone DX extensions are what you can build on top of that, right? And this is really intended to provide support for opinions, observations, dynamic facts, which may change over time. Um, vulnerability disclosure is one of these dynamic facts. So Cyclone supports, um, it, it, again, it is a software bill of material specification, but it's a security first uh, SBOM spec. Um, and being security first, we have a lot of security like features. Uh, so we support remediation and disclosure. Now the remediation is actually built into a component's pedigree. I'm using X component. I fixed a security defect in that component. You can document a, a, that as part of a component's pedigree, but it also supports disclosure. So I'm using a component and I might want to provide the list of vulnerabilities that that component is affected by. If we look at component remediation, um, I have a component and maybe I am using a vulnerable version of Apache Tomcat, right? And, but for whatever reason, I can't upgrade. And so therefore I'm going to patch my version of Apache Tomcat. So I can make a patch, I can uh, optionally uh, document the commits and or the diff that the patch actually um, is. Uh, but I can also say that it resolves zero or more issues. It resolves a security issue. It creates, uh, uh, it resolves a, a defect. It actually adds some additional functionality. But I can specify specifically what security defect my patch actually resolves. To provide a more concrete example, this is what it would look like. So in this particular case, this, this patch is a backport. I'm optionally including the diff and I'm stating that it resolves this particular CVE, right?
you can have on a patch, you can have multiple security issues or multiple uh, defects or multiple enhancements that you are um, stating that you are addressing. Uh, and these, again, these are static facts. These do not change over time. In terms of remediation, um, it does not attempt to communicate the effectiveness of the remediation. Um, that is, um, you know, usually the job of a security researcher, right? Um, it is the opinion of somebody based on their knowledge at a point in time. So based on that, the effectiveness is not actually included in Cyclone DX. We don't even attempt to, to address that problem. Cyclone DX also does not describe uh, remediations that occur in a build at runtime or as part of an environment, uh, which is outside of the code that you're actually describing. Um, many remediations can take place outside of the code that the SBOM actually describes. So we don't address that either, uh, but that can be addressed through configuration management tools. Now for vulnerability disclosure, um, a component can, buy, can be affected by multiple vulnerabilities, right? Um, these are dynamic things. They can change over time. Uh, and therefore, uh, dis vulnerability disclosure uh, capabilities are not built into the core specification. It is an extension. Um, multiple SCA vendors, uh, multiple container security vendors are using this extension today. So lots of folks are using this today. Essentially what it does is this. Um, for any given component, um, I'm referring to the package URL of that component in my SBOM. And I'm describing that this component is affected by CVE 2018-7489. I can have zero or more risk ratings so I can have this particular risk rating as a CVSS V3. I can also have a V2 in there. I can also have like an OWASP risk rating um, and uh, in other risk ratings as well. So it is possible to say that this vulnerability is, has CVSS V2 and V3, but it's also possible to use OWASP risk rating to give a more um, realistic view of what the actual impact is. Unfortunately, a lot of the um, CVSS uh, in general is just not really well designed for describing the real world impact of, of vulnerabilities that are included in third party applications. So other risk ratings can be included there. Um, List of advisories, um, if there are any. Couple notes on disclosure. Uh, the vulnerability extension uh, communicates instances of vulnerabilities. And this is important because it, it leads to a, um, uh, an increased bomb size, right? Uh, if I have more than one uh, component that is affected by the same vulnerability, I can, I actually have to, per the spec, describe each one separately. And the reason being is that they could both be, have completely different risk ratings. Um, let's see. Um, oh yeah, um, it's not perfect. Extensions are a way to uh, collaborate with the community, do so very, very quickly. Um, and do so in a way that isn't, um, you know, necessarily confined to a slow moving standards process. So we are improving the vulnerability extension. We are currently working with SNCC who is uh, participating in some of these improvements. Um, if you'd like to see some of these improvements, if SBOM is your thing, um, we'd invite you to join. And that's it. Amazing, thank you. Were there any questions on that?
Hi, this is Reed. Uh, my one comment would be just that, you know, every single time we have one of these meetings, it seems somebody has a different format for kind of describing a vulnerability. So there's clearly a problem there um, that we all have different formats that, uh, that are incompatible with each other, um, separate from the SBOM stuff, but just like describing the vulnerability itself. So that's just something of, of note that um, maybe this group I know has, has looked at, but maybe should also uh, see what we can do there. We actually have a, a task which is listing existing standards. And I think once we've, we've documented them, we can see similarities and differences more clearly. Yeah, and I've, and I I've got, that. yep, go, go ahead. Sorry, uh, I have a list and would be happy to contribute it. <laughs> it. Might be a starting point if you'd like. Yeah, so I'll, uh, we also have a starter list. So I'll, I'll um, send that to you and you, you tell us what we're missing. But I think that the, interest, the important context is that we wanna see how well those formats work for um, like open source use cases. And one of the things that we need to do, I think in parallel and kind of compare and contrast those two things is to elaborate on the pain points we're trying to address for uh, various actors in the ecosystem, right? So maintainers, security researchers, uh, or also coordination centers or uh, companies that do, uh, for example, vulnerability disclosure for downstream software or upstream software, sorry. Um, so there's, um, I think, um, like some work on analyzing the formats themselves and also like how do they work for use cases we care about. Oh, thanks for the thanks for the spreadsheet. We'll, we'll add it to the uh, to the meeting notes. Oh, sure, I can I can put it there too. Sorry. Cool. Do you have any um, any more questions for Steve while we have him here? <laughs> thanks, Steve. Of yeah. course, anytime. And if you're be uh, curious to know if you if this group ever comes up with a, uh, I don't want to say I, I don't want to say a standard, but at least uh, <laughs> an, an agreed upon uh, way to to do things would uh, would definitely improve the situation. I think, and uh, I'll de I'll definitely be watching this working group going forward because I think it's going to. Uh, it's going to, I think the work that you guys are doing is going to have a lot of impact for S bombs and all kinds of other things globally. So, yeah, there, there's uh, like, I, I think right now, honestly, like maybe it's my personal perspective. We're just, just now right in the more of a discovery mode where what are the problems to be solved? Uh, what's the prior art? And um, I think or going forward, we're really have a few interesting um, ideas to. Uh, to work on. Um, and while we have a few more minutes, Dan, you wanted to chat about a project that could use some help and advisory. So maybe if we can squeeze that in for yeah, the humans yeah. as we have and left. I, I think I can be uh, brief here. So I get to work in a couple other um, umbrella open source organizations that have a lot of different projects at different sizes, different uh, places in their maturity life cycle. And I'm looking at helping to pair up between our working groups and these projects where they've got different needs that OpenSSF uh, contributors can help them with. And then um, vice versa, that it looks like a good opportunity to feed in requirements, uh, some visceral understanding of what real world open source projects need. Uh, in this case, there's a relatively young project called Cactus and I can uh, put the details for this into uh, the meeting notes. Um, but they just went through Dave's badging project process. And one of the discoveries for them was they didn't really understand vulnerability reporting and disclosure. And they're looking for somebody to help uh, give them a few pointers how to get started with, with best practices there. So I'm looking for uh, one or two volunteers that are willing to show up to one of their, one of their weekly meetings. They meet uh, Mondays at 6 p.m. Pacific time, 2 a.m. GMT. Um, and uh, it could probably be in, in any of these upcoming weeks. Yeah, 
I, I think we can definitely look for a volunteer or two on our end. Okay, so, so you can you can reach out on Slack, or uh, I'll also drop my uh, email into uh, into the chat here. Yeah, or uh, you can either create a GitHub issue; those work pretty well, or uh, post to the mailing list. Uh, both of them, those will work fine as well. But I, I can take your email as well and take it from here and coordinate all of that. So uh, I, I think this is a very fair trade, uh, trading advisory for requirements. Sounds sounds awesome to me. Um, all righty, we have one minute. A any last minute uh, questions, comments, thoughts? And I can go ahead and put the, uh, uh, the issue in. So you don't have to worry about that. Okay, coolio. Uh, thank you all. That was uh, that was an awesome meeting. We need to make our uh, next one even better. Okay, I'll I'll stop the recording and I'll post the meeting notes and the recording tomorrow. Okay, see you all. Yeah.